it's impossible to imagine what it's like just to be expected to go back and be the same person. At one time, like six weeks afterwards, I, I was upset and my father said, well, I guess it's going to take you a little longer to get over this than I thought. Yeah, like 40, 50 years, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think it might. Who am I? 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 This is Who Am I Really? A podcast about adoptees that have located and connected with their biological family members. I'm Damon Davis, and you're about to meet Lynn. She's got a New York accent, but she called me from North Carolina. As a young girl, Lynn lived amidst too much chaos in her home. Pregnant with nowhere to turn, she placed her daughter for adoption, the hardest thing she's ever been forced to do. In reunion, Lynn was stunned to receive her daughter's call out of the blue, was thankful at how quickly they were able to see each other, but their relationship has not gotten deeper. Lynn is a first mother, and this is her journey. Lynn was born in Brooklyn, New York. Then her family moved out to Long Island during what she affectionately called her wonder years. That should have been a carefree time in Lynn's life, but her home was a chaotic place. She said characterizing her home life as having a few challenges would be like saying Noah's Ark experienced a little rain. Instead of being a carefree kid, Lynn told me that she felt a responsibility for her younger siblings who experienced the same chaos she lived through at home. She was searching for a place where she would matter to someone at a young, vulnerable time in her life. And she found herself in a vulnerable situation for a young girl. You're not pregnant at 14 because you're living a wonderful life, right? My mother was an active alcoholic. She actually lost custody of her children. So that kind of throws a description of what the family life was, right? Like in, in the 70s, when a woman loses custody of her children, it was, a, it was rough, right? How, may I ask, how many of mm -hmm. you were there? And she lost custody of you and your siblings? Right. Yeah. Now, it, it took a while, right? There are four of us, right? I have an older sister and a younger brother and a sister. My mother didn't lose custody of us until I was already 17. My older sister then was not in the removal, I guess you could say, because she was over 18. My brother and sister and I then when we were removed from my mother we were we didn't go into the system or anything we went to live with my father so we didn't go into the system but we were still taken from my mother right the police come and take you out of your house it's rather no matter where you go it leaves an impression on you mm -hmm. so it was turbulent right I would imagine that most of mothers who find themselves in a similar situation they're not there because they had the love and the attention and the care that they needed, mm -hmm. right? Can you describe a little bit of what turbulence looks like for a family whose mother is an alcoholic? What were some of the challenges that you kids faced? Oh, well, there was a fair amount of putting your hand through the doors, right? I'd be in an argument with somebody and I would close the door and my father would put his fist through the door saying, don't close the door on me. <laughs> police came to the house pretty regularly. I remember one Christmas that the police were at the house three times on one Christmas day. My older sister, she was kind of physically abused by my father. He didn't hit me that way. But my older sister, I would, I would think in today's climate, that my father would have been in significant legal problems. But things were thrown and hit and, um, you know, I, I don't want to get in. The gory sure. details, my mother tried to strangle me with a, an electrical cord. I mean, those kinds of things, It's it seems like gory details. But it was turbulent, right? There was a lot of yelling, screaming, pushing, fighting. Yeah, and, and I don't mean to yeah. make you outline every single instance of it. Yeah. I was just trying to get a sense right. of 
right, what right, it means right, because right. it's different things for different people. You've outlined violence sure. and sometimes people right. it's verbal abuse more than anything else. Sometimes it's just a complete absence of even being present to mm-hmm. care for the child. And so I, I apologize. <laughs> I don't mean to make you go through that. No, and you are right. You're absolutely right. There are lots of ways to be dysfunctional, mm-hmm. right? I, I married a Russian, right? And so Anna coming in and the beginning line is, all happy families are the same and all dysfunctional families are dysfunctional in their own way. Mm-hmm. So you're absolutely right that there are lots of ways to be turbulent. Mm-hmm. And mine was that there was a certain amount of aggression and there was a certain amount of the emotional abuse. So, but you, you're right. So Everybody's different. As a 14 year old girl, tell me where you were then mm-hmm. in 12, 13, 14, what were you mm-hmm. doing? Were you seeking what were you seeking outside of your home, perhaps, to validate mm-hmm. your, your existence? Or tell me a little bit about your mentality and what kinds of things you were into. Yeah, I was probably looking for somebody to care for me. I was probably looking for somebody who thought I had value or who I was probably looking for love, right? I mean, what do kids need, right? They need to be loved. And so were you right? hanging they, out they... with your friends in the street? Or were you just like, it sounds to me, I'm making an assumption here and I don't want to put words mm-hmm. in your mouth, but it sounds to me mm-hmm. like... I know if I was having that much challenge at home, I would be out Mm -hmm. there and I would be looking for friends and I would be looking for fun and I'd be looking for an outlet. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what was happening for you? I would say so. I I would say so. I was, I was out. Yeah, I was out. I was doing things I wasn't supposed to be doing. And were you, so you got pregnant at 14 years old. Was this a boyfriend, Mm -hmm. a long-term? Tell me a little bit about the circumstances for your conception. Well, out of respect to my daughter, I'm going to skip that if you don't mind. It wasn't two kids sitting in the back seat, right? So there, there's a, a backstory behind that. And out of respect to her, I don't think I want to share her story. That's but what I have said is that she may not have been conceived in love, but she was loved the minute she was conceived. Yeah. Wow. So what does that mean? The minute then? she was conceived. Would you tell me what that means? That means the minute I found out that I was pregnant. I stopped smoking, <laughs> right? I start. I, I stopped uh, smoking, all sorts of things. I immediately knew that I wanted to care for her. Mm-hmm. Did you have plans to keep her? I would have, but 1976, well, I was pregnant in 75. I had her in 76, and in 1975, I was told directly that she couldn't come home, right? That I wasn't coming home with the baby, right? What do you do when and you're 14 and... 1975, and you told you can't come home. I I wanted to keep her. Who told you I, that? I couldn't. Uh, my father. So what then happened for you? You're now pregnant. You mm-hmm. have revealed this to your family. Your father mm-hmm. has told you you cannot come home with a baby. What happens mm-hmm. between conception and delivery are you allowed to be in the house were you asked to leave the house and don't come back tell me what happened so that's kind of interesting you know i was home for a while and uh uh it was 1975 right so abortion had just become legal okay abortion had just become legal but i wasn't going to have an abortion right i wasn't going to have an abortion and my parents wanted me to have an abortion but i loved i loved my daughter Right. I loved my daughter and I wasn't going to have an abortion. So I was home for a little while and the sentiment was, oh, we're so proud of you. But go on upstairs because somebody's coming. and You don't want to be seen. So but then afterwards, around, I guess I was probably six, seven months pregnant. I was sent away. I was sent away to a family home as opposed to one of the homes. Right. I was I one of those maternity homes. I was sent to an individual home and I stayed there until I gave birth and then I returned home without a baby. Was this home that you were sent to, was it someone that you knew or was this Oh no, it was somebody that that it was arranged for, right? So like many I went through I, I went through Catholic charities and it was an arrangement that they had gotcha. um, with the with family. Yeah. Gotcha. So it sounds like it was almost like a, I don't know if this is the right word, but like a foster home. When a person is born and goes into adoption, yeah. there's an interim place that they go 
that is arranged. Yes, yes. And so this sounds like a basically a foster home for birth mothers. Yes. Wow. Yes, I would say so. I would say so. And how I was your experience so. there? You've been now separated from your family. You're mm-hmm. 14, which is a highly emotional mm-hmm. time for a young woman anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you're pregnant and you're away from your home. Right. How far did yeah. you go from home? And what was it like for you to be in this place yeah. by yourself? That's a good question. So I probably... Yeah, so I, I, I might have just turned 15. And it was, I don't know, I never really thought about it like that. To, to answer that question, it, it was almost calm, right? Because I was out of the tension of my house. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, wow. Right? I can't, yeah, that I was out of that turmoil. But I, I remember, I, I, it's, it's kind of weird, the bedroom that I had, uh, when I got into the bedroom that the people gave me, she said, make sure you close your blinds. <laughs> I, thought, I, was like, I was like, what? <laughs> She's like, make sure you close your blinds when you get changed. It was interesting. I guess she thought that I was going to flash her neighbors or something. Uh. I don't know. <laughs> Us wayward women, we don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> mm, yeah, she had her so, own preconceived notions about a 14-year-old yeah. girl just being this right. loose right. spirit. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Right, wow. right, right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I've told this to my daughter. When I was away, she was always with me, so I was never alone. Hmm. You were together. Mm-hmm. Hmm. What did you do to nurture yourself during that time? You said you quit smoking. You obviously, I mean, I assume yeah. you were drinking and smoking and hanging yeah, out and yeah, not yeah, getting yeah. enough sleep yeah, before yeah, you yeah. got pregnant. Tell me about nurturing right. yourself when no. you got pregnant. I quit smoking <laughs> and drinking and, and smoking other things. That was, I don't know what, I don't think I did anything other than that. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I understand. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, you know, I, in the beginning, I, I was going to school, <laughs> right? I, you know, I, I was a 14 year old. I, I, I was going to ninth grade. Yeah. So yeah, there's not much nurturing that a 14 year old does. Right? I don't know. And that'd be a hard answer, a hard question for me to answer now. Yeah. But, I guess and this is a question that comes out of today. Uh-huh. We are so much more conscious of mm-hmm. health related. Yeah care Mm -hmm. like just i mean we think about diet and supplements and exercise and Mm -hmm. and mental health and it's just a different environment from the 70s so i guess it's not really a fair question for a 15 year old of the 70s to think right so i I wonder you mentioned Mm -hmm. you were in the ninth grade did you tell your Mm -hmm. friends you were pregnant and what did they say oh no i i had one friend who knew i was pregnant but but that was it no he didn't say anything i didn't say anything wow i and when i left i left school I was sent away uh, as soon as I began to show, right? As soon as I began to show, I was sent away. And the school was told that I had mononucleosis, right? Because that's a long-term illness, right? Uh, who knows who believes it and who doesn't believe it, right? <laughs> yeah, you didn't say anything. Are you kidding me? Did I tell my friends? No. <laughs> you don't tell anybody. No, that's wild. Hmm. I've told the story before. Yeah, I have a, my younger brother is seven years younger than me. When I was reunited with my daughter, I called up my brother and I said, do you know that I had a baby when I was 15? I mean, you don't tell anybody. Really? So you you didn't reveal to him, Mm. oh my gosh, until reunion. That's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, because I was sent away, right? Yeah. And he was, he's seven. What does he know? I'm sure they said, oh, your sister's sick. (laughs) Right. 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 And so uh, I didn't tell my brother. And he would have been navigating his own challenges in the tumultuous family that you've described also. So he would not have been yeah. paying acute attention to everything that you were going through either. Yeah, uh, uh, Absolutely. And when, when you say, can I describe my turmoil? He has his own turmoil that, yeah, so we were all going through our own stuff. Nobody would have noticed. At 15 years old, Lynn was pregnant and sent away to conceal her status and to give birth to her daughter in secret away from her community. During her time at the home, She was given some prenatal vitamins for her health, but no additional information was provided about what she might experience when she gave birth. There was no expectation setting for what it would be like to be in labor. No female mentor to walk her through the possibilities for her birthing experience. No structured learning like in Lamaze class. Lynn had no idea what was going on around her. She was left to her own ignorance about the process and her fears about what was to come. When it was time for her to deliver, Lynn was taken to the hospital and dropped off. 
She was 15, a minor, alone, with only her unborn daughter in her belly. Lynn was left in the hospital hallway. She knows now that the hospital she was taken to was a teaching hospital, so there was a combination of doctors and interns learning to be doctors, a parade of strangers checking to see how dilated she was. This repetitive stream of unknown people were asking her questions about the most private parts of herself. And these guys are coming up to say, oh, so how dilated are you? I don't even know what the word dilated means kind of deal. So I eventually go into labor. Again, I don't know what's going on. So I'm telling all these people, I got to go to the bathroom. (laughs) I got to go to the bathroom. You have to let me go to the bathroom. And they're like, no, you don't have to go to the bathroom. I was like, yeah, I I know what it feels like to have to go to the bathroom. I got to go to the bathroom. And I actually, I guess I complained so much that they let me sit on the toilet. But of course, I didn't have to go to the bathroom. (laughs) My daughter was sitting on my my bladder. Mm. Anyway, so I, I gave birth and then I was taken off the maternity ward, right? So I didn't get to hold her, right? They took her away and I was sent off to another part of the hospital because the maternity ward is for people who are who are mothers, right? Who right? And so afterwards I go to the maternity ward to try to see my daughter and they won't let me. They won't let me see her. So I kind of go back to my room. My father does come to see me afterwards, and I told him that they wouldn't let me see my daughter, and he actually arranged it. So I was able to go and see my daughter on the outside through the glass. I got to see her, and I saw her when my my family came with my father. So I saw her then, and I once snuck back and saw her again by myself. (laughs) So I got to see her twice, and I saw her, right? She was amazing. She had my face. She had my lips. She didn't have my hair, but she had my face. I didn't get a picture. My, I wasn't allowed to have a picture of her, but but I had her in my mind's eye. I carried her in my mind's eye. And I remember the first time I saw, the first time when my friends had a baby, I was full of all sorts of emotion, full of all sorts of emotion. And Because you're like, oh, well, I know the difference, right? Do all babies look alike or something along that line? Or who knows what you think? But. I knew what my daughter looked like. And the minute I saw my daughter, I knew she was my daughter. I knew her. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. It must have been so emotional. And it must have been so emotional, too, to have been denied access to her, right? You have carried Mm -hmm. this child in your body for months, endured Mm -hmm. all kinds of discomfort, and tried to care for Mm -hmm. yourself so that she could Mm -hmm. come out healthy. And then the Mm -hmm. moment she arrives in this world, you're separated. No contact. Yes. That must have been horrible. It's it's evil. What happened what happened was evil. There's a sacred bond. And it was broken. And it shouldn't have been. I agree. What did you think of your father advocating for you to see your daughter? This is someone who you had been cast out by who has cast his share of abuses towards your siblings. Yet in mm-hmm. that moment, he came to see you, one, and two, he advocated mm-hmm. for you to see your daughter. Did What did you think of him in that yeah. time? My father, there were a lot of complications, right? There was a lot of complications. And said that my father did abuse my older sister. He, I don't want to, I don't want to paint him as an, as the villain, right? He wasn't a villain. I think he was a product of his time. Right. And I think he thought he was doing what was right kind of deal. Right. I mean, it's hard to judge a person from yesterday using today's standards. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. I I think he was I think he was doing what he could at the time, but he did. He made sure that I got to see her. And if he hadn't, I wouldn't have. If he hadn't, if he hadn't intervened, I would have never seen her. When I asked Lynn about who picked her up from the hospital her transition home, and her re-entry into her former life, she chuckled nervously and reminded me that she had just endured a very traumatizing experience. Who remembers that stuff? (laughs) Mm -hmm. I've blocked all of that out, right? The mind is an amazing thing, and it doesn't allow you to remember what, what you can't handle. And so I don't have much recollection of coming back into my life. It's very shoddy, the information that's there. 
I'm glad um, you said that, though, the notion that a traumatized brain will block out things, mm -hmm. because this is one of the mm -hmm. challenges that adoptees have in mm -hmm. trying to accumulate facts from the stories of our birth mothers mm -hmm. is many times by the time we find you, we have done such an exhaustive investigation and tried mm -hmm. to learn as many details as possible that mm -hmm. our assumption can be we have accumulated the facts. Why can't you recall them? And mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. a, a bit of an admitted lack of empathy sometimes, not mm -hmm. by all, but mm -hmm. every once in a while, an adoptee will feel like, why can't she remember this? Why can't she tell me this? Mm -hmm. But what mm -hmm. you've outlined is that the traumatized brain, in order to cope, will, in mm -hmm. fact, block out stuff in order to try to get yes. by. It's a it's literally yeah. a coping mechanism for survival. And, yeah. and you've absolutely outlined that. So while you kind of chuckled at the fact that you couldn't remember. It's actually an important part of the trauma that you two went through. Mm -hmm. And we often mm -hmm. in the adoptee community talk about adoption as trauma. I often mm -hmm. remind people, don't forget that adoption never starts from an awesome place. I've never, uh -huh. ever spoken to an adoptee and nor any birth mother that said, listen, life was really good. Actually, I was just I was doing fine. And I just woke yeah. up one day and decided, you know what? I think I'm just going to put this baby for adoption. It never yeah. goes that way. It's always yeah. there's a backstory that has some level of a trauma associated with it. And, and you've absolutely outlined that. So I just wanted yeah. to make sure to yeah. underscore that your inability to remember that transition back to your life is not born out of your desire to forget as much as your mm -hmm. intent to survive yourself and mm -hmm. get on with your life. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. And yeah. And I, and you said I chuckled. Yeah. Cause chuckle or cry, yeah. you, you know, laugh or you what, cry. What, what are, and, and so, so I wasn't laughing because it was funny. I was laughing because it's absurd to think what we went through, mm -hmm. and we were just supposed to go back and and live our lives again. I, I was supposed to go back to tenth grade. I was supposed to worry about. Uh, I was about to say biology, and then I decided I wanted to use a different subject. Right? You know, I'm supposed to go back to mm -hmm. to be worried about world history. Are you kidding me? It's impossible. It's impossible to imagine. What, what you did? It's a, it's impossible to imagine what it's like just to be expected to go back and be the same person. Right? I've said this before. My father, and again, I there there are mixed feelings and all that kind of stuff. But at one time, like six weeks afterwards. I was upset, and my father said, well, I guess it's going to take you a little longer to get over this than I thought. Yeah, like 40, 50 years, <laughs> right? I, I guess it's going to take you a little longer to get over this. Yeah, I think it might. Yeah. I think it might take a little bit longer. And I do want to, I, I kind of started off before we kind of probably hit the record button. I'm my daughter's mother, right? I'm her first mother. The term birth mother, I think, denies my role in her life. I didn't just give birth to her, but I mothered her, right? I was her first mother and I cared for her as much as I could. And I think language also sets a mindset, right? And I think first mother, it kind of honors my role. And also it makes sense, right? There's a first mother and a second mother, right? Mm -hmm. The adoptive parents are really kind of like the this, this second parents. When I married my husband, his first wife died. I am his second wife. And when I understand that, and I allow my husband to talk about his first wife, about his first wife, then I support him more, right? And I know that there are times that he wishes his first wife was here, right? I have a stepdaughter. So when she got married, he would have liked his first wife to be there. When she had kids, he would have liked his first wife to be there. And if I can support that, if I can support him wanting to have a relationship with his first wife, I think it supports him better. And it makes our relationship stronger also, right? Mm -hmm. So if adoptive parents could allow their adopted child, right, their child, to be mournful of losing their first mother, don't you think that would be healthier, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be nice for adoptive parents to say, I, I bet you wish your first mother was here to see you graduate from high school. 
just that acknowledgement, I, I think it would go a long way to help ease some of the tension that adoptees have with this duality of first mother and second mother and so on. This is a wonderful point. I'm really glad that you raised that because language is important. The way we express mm -hmm. ourselves and how we mm -hmm. articulate the things that we're going through and the roles of people in our lives is incredibly mm -hmm. valuable. And it can be an indicator of how you feel about a person. And so for the adopted person who knows that their first mother did not necessarily want to be a mother, they may choose to refer to that person as a birth mother because that mm -hmm. person's role, all they really mm -hmm. wanted to do was give birth to the child and be done. But what you've mm -hmm. indicated is that you wanted to keep your child. You were just not mm -hmm. allowed to do so. So you mm -hmm. nurtured your body and yourself in order to give her the birth mm -hmm. that would make her healthy. And in that role, you very much are her first mother, mm -hmm. that you in, had every intention of making her life good and that mm -hmm. you set yourself up and her to be mm -hmm as healthy as possible. And so you think of yourself as a mother and I'm with you hundred percent. I don't want to say too much because you nailed it, but I, right. I really appreciate how you made the analogy of a first wife. There's, there's a lot mm -hmm. of firsts in our lives mm -hmm. and, right. And, right. and you're absolutely right that it's an opportunity yeah. it to acknowledge yeah. the role of the person who brought us into the world. Right. And it doesn't take away, like, I don't feel less loved by my husband because um his second wife. Right. 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 It's, we have our first loves, right? That doesn't take away, that doesn't mean that we can only have our first love and then that's it, right? Otherwise, we'd all be married when we were 12, right? Mm -hmm. Right? So so we move on. There's a lot of firsts, but that doesn't take away from who we are, right? Yeah. We have to be comfortable. Sometimes my husband will say something like, well, my wife and I went to X, Y, or Z. And the the little insecure part of me says, oh, I don't remember going there. <laughs> but the secure part of me says, well, tell me about what, did you like it? Did you have fun? You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. just, you know, I have to be able to I hear that to be able to support my husband. A afterwards, I, you know, after I lost my daughter, right, I still cared for her, right? And what could I do to care for her, right? I was on the organ donation list, right? Because she might one day need my organs, right? Yeah. She wouldn't need anything else from me, but one day she might need my kidney, right? So, so I put my name on the organ, right? I sent off for, for, at the time it was, you swapped yourself or something and got on the list. And I prayed for her. I prayed for her adopted mother that she could be the best mother that she could for. Her. So, you know, it's, it's not quite as simple as, as one and done, right? Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of emotion in it. Yeah. I'll say yeah. one final thing on this for me, which mm -hmm. is one of the adoptees that I interviewed made this wonderful point that they were speaking to their adoptive parents who had mm -hmm. ended up having biological children as well mm -hmm. themselves as a couple. Mm -hmm. And they said to their parents, you know, if you're not comfortable with me finding my first mother, then let me ask you this. When you had, you know, the name of the first child that they gave birth to, mm -hmm. why didn't you stop there? You've got enough love that you wanted to have another child. The same thing is true for me. I can have had mm -hmm. you as my parents and love you and mm -hmm. have enough love in my heart to go back and try to locate the first mother that brought me into this mm -hmm. world. And so there's a complementary yeah. adoptive yeah. component to the, the moniker of being first. Leaving Lynn's teenage years, I was very curious about her mentality as she went on with her life. Many adoptees are very curious about whether we were remembered or forgotten, loved or loathed, cherished or trashed. I asked Lynn how she thought about her daughter over the years. I've always thought about her. She was always on my mind. She was always, whenever there was a, a lull, whenever I wasn't doing anything. So I ended up I ended up, I don't want to brag, right? But I ended up getting a PhD, right? And why did I end up getting a PhD? Because I could never stop, right? Because I, I always, I was always looking for something else. I, I was always moving forward. My feet couldn't stay still. So I was always driven to do something, right? Whenever I stopped, she was there. I've used this analogy before. I was an amputee, right? It was like I'd lost, uh, I lost a leg, right? But I had a 
prosthetic and I worked that prosthetic, right? But I had pants on, so nobody knew that I had a prosthetic and I worked it. But at night, when I went to bed, I had to take my pants off, right? And she was always part of my life. I baked for her birthday every year, right? I had a, I'm Catholic and I, I have a permanent candle in my church for her. I always thought of her. I'm always amazed. I, I've heard adoptees saying, did she think of me? I have stretch marks. I have stretch marks. Every time I take a shower, she's there. I couldn't take a shower without seeing the physical reminders that she was with me. Yeah, same is true for my, yeah, I was born via cesarean section. So my my birth mother okay. had a scar on her body. Same mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. the stretch marks on your own. There's a physical mm -hmm. representation that you mm -hmm. have an appendage that mm -hmm. was clipped mm -hmm. from your life. And, and it's interesting to hear, too, I understand that you were not trying to brag, but I also understand what you were trying to convey, that if you had stood still too long, it would have just mm -hmm. washed over you. And so you just, it sounds yes. like you were just trying to achieve and go and keep moving, occupy your mind, fill your right. heart with other things so that mm -hmm. in some way mm -hmm. you could continue to get by. Lynn earned a position teaching at a university, and near the end of the school year, she was closing out her work and cleaning up her office. As she sat at her desk at 2 p.m. on a Thursday afternoon, Lynn was looking forward to getting out of the office and heading home. As if she needed one more thing to do, her phone rang. Annoyed that someone was probably adding something to her to-do list, Lynn answered, barely paying attention to the caller, distracted by her desire to hit the road. The voice on the other end was being cryptic when they asked to verify Lynn's home address. Confused, Lynn asked what the caller was inquiring about. The caller said they wanted to mail her a letter, and they just wanted to make sure they had the correct mailing address. Lynn asked what this odd call was about, but the person said their interests were personal in nature. And she starts to talk, and I'm not paying any attention, until she says, I was born on such and such date. And I said, what date? <laughs> and she said, the date. And I was like, what date? And she said the date and I just, the tears started to fall and I started to try to explain my life and, and what happened. And I, I once talked to my daughter about this conversation and she said, you were like a kid who got their hands caught in the cookie jar because I guess I was trying to apologize and explain and all of these kinds of issues about what was going on. And I probably rambled for five minutes and then I stopped and I said, well, you've probably been thinking about this for a while. I'm going to stop and, and let you talk. And she said, well, I, I was just going to mail you this letter. And um, she was like, I, I could read you the letter. And I was like, okay, that sounds like a good idea. And so we talked. And um, during the conversation, I asked if I could meet her. And she said, yes. And I, I was like, well, so what are you doing tomorrow? I'll come up tomorrow. And she was like busy. And I said, what are you doing the next day? Which was Saturday. And she's busy. And mm -hmm. what are you doing Sunday? She's busy. And so I said, well, what are you doing tonight for dinner? And we met that night. She lives an eight hour drive from me now. And so we met at a hotel four hours in between the two of us. Oh, my God. So we met. And it was amazing. Right? The same um, day she called you, you met her that night. I couldn't get there fast enough. Oh my God. So what was it like? Tell me about the moment that you go to this hotel. Tell me about your drive. You've got a four hour drive. Did you go by mm -hmm, yourself? Mm -hmm. And what was your mindset? Yeah, so I did go by myself. I came back to my house and put some things together. And my husband asked me, do you want me to go with you? And I was like, no. At the time, my mother-in-law was living with me. And now my husband, so let me just say, my husband had known about my daughter but nobody else did right i had i have two other children and he has i have a stepdaughter and nobody else knew about my daughter and so my husband said should i tell my mother and i was like no i said we're not telling the words exactly were along the line of i need to know what she wants first if she doesn't want to have a relationship with me then we go back to status quo right if she didn't want this if she was just looking for an answer or two and i told him that i needed to do this by myself so she got to the hotel before me, and when I got there, I called her to say that I was here, and she came out of her room, and we met in the hallway. And when I hugged her, I was hugging my 
I was hugging my baby, right? My my whole body responded. It's it's really kind of it's really kind of amazing when you think about it. I mean, it was as if I was that 15 year old and somebody finally put her baby in her arms. The emotion that came over me, it was amazing. And it was a physical reaction. It was a physical reaction. It really was as if I was 15 and I was able to hold my child. I was was in my 50s, right, when this all happened, right, when I got reconnected. I've held a lot of people, <laughs> right? My, I've touched a lot of people. I, But this touch was like nobody else's, right? It, it was a physical and a spiritual connection. No other, right? It's, I really, it was the reconnection of the bond. God, that sounds like and, an unbelievable yeah. moment. I'm a mess over here right now. Yeah, it, yeah, it was amazing, right? It was a completion, right? It was. It, it, it was a reconnection. I mean, it, literally, it's a reconnection, a reattachment. Right. Wow, a reattachment. Yeah, it's it's like the it's like the rubber band kind of came back together, right? Like the bond is always there. If you think the bond is a rubber band, it stretched really far, but the minute you let go of those other ends, it comes back, right? Right. That's so so analogy. it just. Wow. It just snapped back. So what did you all do that night? What And tell me what you saw. This is a person whom you saw her as an infant, and you saw elements of your own looks on her at that mm -hmm. time. But now this is the full-grown version of the person that you gave yeah. birth to so many mm -hmm. years ago. What did you see in her, and what did you guys do for the rest of the night? What did I see in her? That's a good question. I mean, I, I've said this, I just knew her. The way a mother knows her children, I just knew her. There was a comfort there. We talked all night, right? We talked all night, and I never. It's three o'clock in the morning, and she's like, "I gotta go to sleep," and I'm like, "No, uh, I don't want to leave. I, I just want to." I actually said this to her, "I'll just watch you sleep. You go to sleep. I'll just watch you sleep." And she's like, "No, that's, that's no. You don't have to do that. <laughs> you, you can go back to your room because it was just." A little bit creepy for somebody to say, I just want to watch you sleep. But it was just, we just talked. And there was a, for me anyhow, and I hope for her, there was just a sense of, of knowing her, right? I, I, I don't have details, right? I don't, yeah. I don't know some details, but I know her, right? Um, because you know she's of me, right? I mean, she's me. I know what she's thinking because cause that's what I'm thinking, <laughs> right? right? Right. I, I can, I, I know that there's a lot of discussion about, this issue about th this idea about unconditional love and, and all that kind of stuff. I know how to love my daughter better than anybody else because I'm her first mother, right? And nobody can love you the way your first mother can love you. That is true. And I want to go back to something you said. You said you wanted to just mm -hmm. watch her sleep and you said it felt creepy, but this is mm -hmm. two adults. And I think the thing that yeah. I want to help people realize what you were probably feeling in that moment is. <laughs> For anybody out there who's ever had a child, that's what you mm -hmm. do. When that baby is mm -hmm. sleeping, you stand mm -hmm. there over the crib and you marvel over this child and you watch them sleep and they're so stupid cute and you can't get over it. Mm -hmm. And this is, I just want to make sure people recognize that this is something that you've never got with her. So while it right. might sound creepy as adults in this first mm -hmm. moment of reunion, quite literally, mm -hmm. you've already said, I felt like that 15 year old girl again, in which mm -hmm. case, of mm -hmm. course, you would have had mm -hmm. these feelings of wanting to get back mm -hmm. some of the things that you never got to do with her, whether you even right. could have articulated it or not. So right. I'm, right. I'm with you 100 percent on that. Yeah. And I think that in lies some of the problems that existed after. I think that for me, I was like that new mother who just wanted to be with her her baby, right? So I think that I was maybe too present, right? Right? Because I just, I didn't want to let go, right? I, I just didn't want to let go. I just, I found her or she found me. And I came up with this thought the other day that if somebody stole a thousand dollars from you and then they said, oh, look, we found your money here. You can have it back, but we're only going to give you $500 of it. You would be like, no, I, I want it all. 
right? I, I want it all. I just don't want part. And I think that kind of happened, right? She was taken from me. And then when she was returned, I couldn't get the whole thing back. <laughs> does that make sense? It absolutely right? does. Like, like I'm looking for all my money back, right? I'm looking for all of it back. I didn't want you to take it in the first place. And so when I get it back, I, I want it all back. But unfortunately, you can't get it all back. But I think early on, I didn't understand that. I think I, I just wanted it all back because in my mind, it's yours. At one time, kind of early in the reunion, I asked my daughter, what does she want? One out of our relationship. And when she said X, Y, or Z, and I said, well, that sounds like a friend. I'm, I'm not looking for a friend. I'm looking for my daughter, right? And so I, I think that, I think I could have overwhelmed her at first. And still some, right? And still some. So I'm yeah. sorry. I don't know where that came from. That that You must have said something that... <laughs> triggered that discussion that's okay that's perfectly fine this is not we mm -hmm. don't have a structure here this is whatever you want to yeah. say and how you want to express yeah. it yeah. so yeah. i want to yeah. just ask you two final questions the first mm -hmm. is how is your relationship now there's there's a reduction of interaction on our part i guess you could say i, I don't know so in the beginning it was very intense right in the beginning it was very intense and and there's been some pulling back there's no doors have been shut we we still are in communication periodically. We spoke. She called me before Easter, and we had a conversation. And so there there is interaction, but it's not where I want it to be. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. But I know some where there isn't any communication at all. So I am fortunate that she still wants to communicate me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, the same thing is true for adoptees, right? We. Mm -hmm. sometimes feel fortunate as well that our biological mm -hmm. family members still want mm -hmm. to communicate with us mm -hmm. because it can mm -hmm. be really easy to just go back to your regular life check the box met the person saw if mm -hmm. i look like them or not mm -hmm. eh. mm -hmm. and then just it's an easy path to just return to what you knew before reunion but as with any relationship it takes work and so it's important when we do mm -hmm. feel that someone is thinking about us and reaches out and stuff yeah I, and i think there's an awful lot of pain going around and on both sides and in all sides. My two younger daughters, I think that they have pain because of everything that they've missed. I think that there's a lot of pain and sometimes the easiest way is just to go back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. The other thing I wanna ask you about is your mm -hmm. current body of work. You are mm -hmm. doing a survey about mm -hmm. the adoption experience. Can you just mm -hmm. share for folks what your survey is, what the intent is, and how people mm -hmm. can find it so that they can be participants in your work. That was great. I was hoping we'd get to this part. So when my interaction with my daughter started to slow down, started to, to pull back, I started to say, I wonder why, <laughs> right? And I had some questions. And so I created, and so as I mentioned earlier, I, I did get a PhD. So I'm a university professor and I went to what do we do right we go to look at the research to see what the research says and I was amazed at what I didn't find and how little research is out there and the research that's out there is the end size the number of subjects per study is so small that how do you make this generalization on it right there's a lot of anecdotal and advice out there, but nothing that says, if you do this, this is going to happen. Right? And if you do that, that's going to happen. So I created this survey and the survey is called Preliminary Exploration into Adoption Reunions. And my goal of this survey was kind of to see if we can't come up with a roadmap about how to do these things, right? What should be done and what shouldn't be done? When I first was reunited with my daughter, I read stuff and, and it said to go slow, but nobody told me what slow looks like. Nobody told me why I should go slow, <laughs> right? They just said go slow w without anything, right? And so I wanted to, to find some answers and I put together a survey that has grown in its scope. Originally, I was only looking at the mother-child reunion experience. But thanks to speaking to other people, 
and you in particular, it grew, right? And it grew to talk about the relationships between including first fathers. And I think what's going to come out of this survey, one of the most significant issues is going to talk about unhealthy behaviors that we have. Um, And that does come directly from you. We had a conversation and I said I was looking at the longevity of, of first moms, right? Because from what I hear from other people and what I've noticed is that the death rate of birth moms tend to be much lower than the average population. And we looked at the survey and I had a question in there about whether or not your mother was alive or not. And you're like, who cares? <laughs> right? And I said, we talked and I said that I had the sense that birth mothers or first mothers die at an earlier rate. And out of our conversation, I saw it, it came out of, well, why are they dying earlier? Right. Mm-hmm. And so I added a section, some questions on both the adoptee and the first mom side that says, kind of, did you develop unhealthy behaviors? And I had, and I listed these unhealthy behaviors that you could have drug abuse and alcohol abuse and physical self harm and hypersexuality. And I listed attempted suicide. And I know that the prevailing rate that people talk about, right, is that adoptees are four times more likely to attempt suicide, right? You've heard that, right? It's, mm-hmm. That's the prevailing sentiment. Well, I could go into that. Now I'm going to kind of go into my research mind, right? So I went and I looked to find out where this four times more likely, where this number came from. And this number came from a study that was done where the team asked about 600 adoptees and 600 non-adoptees, but they didn't ask the adoptee. They had asked the parents of the adoptees whether or not they had attempted suicide Mm -hmm. or not. And they did the same for those who are non-adopted. And that's where they get the four times more likely. Asking the loved ones of somebody, did your loved one attempt suicide or not? I actually asked the adoptee, (laughs) Mm -hmm. did they attempt suicide? And I I don't want to give you the exact numbers because I'm still collecting data, but the number is going to blow you away. Mm -hmm. It's not four times. It's not even four times, four times. It's going to be unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And for first mothers, the number is even larger. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that you're doing this research work. I want to make sure that people know where it is that they can get into your survey so that they can, for their contribution, directly from their own experience. So tell tell, tell people, how do they find your survey? Okay. The survey has a Facebook page, and the Facebook page is called Preliminary Exploration into Adoption Reunions. Let me say it again. Preliminary Exploration into into adoption reunions. And on that Facebook page, there is a link that will take you to the survey. Now, Mm -hmm. this is a research study, right? So it's been through the institutional IRB, which is the institution review board. So it's a sanctioned study. It's not just a, it's not a go poll me kind of study. It it follows the standards for pure empirical Mm -hmm. results. And if you go to that page, you'll find out more about the study and you can read on it. And I have periodically put updates of where we stand right now. Okay. And it's not, and as I said, it's grown in scope. So it's not purely about adoption reunions anymore. I certainly ask a wide variety of questions that go above and beyond uh, people being in reunions. So if you are either a first parent or an adoptee, please let your voice be heard because other people are creating our narratives and having real numbers will provide society with a real understanding mm-hmm. of the complications I agree. and the aftermath. Yeah. Lynn, yeah. I, I appreciate the fact that you're putting research rigor behind this because you're absolutely mm-hmm. right. We get these anecdotal stories told about mm-hmm. us for us. Right. The narrative is mm-hmm. created by other people who are not necessarily living these experiences. And you're absolutely mm-hmm. right that we have to mm-hmm. tell our own stories. And so I just want to thank you, one, for the research that you're doing to bring light to the reality of the adoption experience. But I also want to thank you, secondly, for 
being here with me and sharing your own story, uh, because I think it's important that you have stepped in as a first mother into an adoptee space mm -hmm. to tell your story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm always mm -hmm. talking about how we need to empathize with one another, mm -hmm. and it's important for first mothers to share their stories for us so that adoptees mm -hmm. can hear it firsthand. So we're not making right. assumptions about what you think. So thank you so much, Lynn, yeah. for being here. Yeah. I appreciate you so much. And I appreciate you. I really think that your input made the survey, made this so much better. Um, so and I really think that the mental health issue, I don't think I would have asked those questions if you hadn't pushed me. No, it's so, so thank you. No, I'm just glad um, to work with thank you. On. you. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, make yeah. sure to send me some links to the survey, okay? So when you're, so we make sure that people get involved, all right? Sure, sure. I'll send it out to you. Sounds good, Lynn. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. All the best to Thank you, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye. Hey, it's me. Lynn grew up in a chaotic home with alcoholism and abuse. She described the harrowing experience of being dropped off at the hospital left alone with no information about what was going to happen when she gave birth. Lynn said she never forgot about her daughter, but she kept busy with achievements to ensure the quiet moments were filled and the marks on her body had less space to take over her emotions. I appreciated the perspective Lynn gave us about seeing herself as a first mother in honor of the responsibility she took and the job she did at 15 to bring her daughter into this world. Lynn was so lucky to be able to meet her daughter the same night of their first conversation. But I'm sorry there isn't as tight of a relationship as what Lynn would like. I hope that all of you out there with direct experience with adoption will submit your answers to the preliminary exploration into adoption reunion survey that Lynn has put together. It has been said that you cannot track what you have not measured and surveys are a wonderful way to make sure your voice is heard regarding your experience with adoption. Again, you can find links to the survey on Facebook. The name of the survey is Preliminary Exploration into Adoption Reunions. I'm Damon Davis, and I hope you found something in Lynn's journey that inspired you, validates your feelings about wanting to search, or motivates you to have the strength along your journey to learn, who am I really? If you would like to share your story of adoption and your attempt to connect with your biological family, please visit whoamireallypodcast.com slash share. Also, quick reminder to sign up to receive updates about my second book. The work in progress is going nicely, and I can't wait to share it with you. To learn more, go to whoamireallypodcast.com slash book two. That's book and the number two.